Hola, amigos, amigas, players, playwrights, dude, dudettes, uh, everybody in between. It is time once again for us to revisit that thing we call Game of Crimes. I am here literally with my partner in crime. He's a made man, the one, the only. <laughs> Steve Murphy, buddy. <laughs> but everybody calls me Murph. And welcome back, everybody. It's a pleasure to have you here. And I am El Jefe Morgan, right? El Jefe de K. El Jefe of what? <laughs> El Jefe, El Patron. That is who I am. Uh, <laughs> spoiler alert, Pablo's dead. <laughs> yeah. By the way, so anyway, running joke. Anyway, hey guys, thanks. Welcome back. Uh, we're going to have another fun episode. But before we get started, just some quick housekeeping. Uh, head on over to Apple, Spotify. They got this thing called Five Stars, Single Stars. Just hit those things for us. Help us out. Get us some visibility. We love to bring more listeners and share our stories of wit, humor, wisdom, and everything in between. Uh, also, head on over to our website, GameOfCrimesPodcast.com. We put all of our stuff there, our books list, uh, our merch is over there. Also, follow us on that thing they call social media, at Game of Crimes on Twitter. Game of Crimes podcast on Facebook and the Instagram. But where you got to be, where you got to be, Murph, I ask you once again, where do you got to be? You got to come over and check us out on Patreon. It's Why, uh, <laughs> Why do we have to do that? There's Why? some un unbelievable content over there. It's it's amazing what we've got on there. It, um, believe it or not, I'm shocked by it. Um, there's not a lot of things that shock me anymore. But the amount of information we have on there, we have more content on Patreon, I think, than we have on our podcast. We just finished our monthly Q&A where you as the listeners can ask us any questions you want to. We haven't turned down a single question yet. It can be about it can be about whatever the hell you want to talk about. So what kind of clothes Murph wears. If it's free, it's for me. That's his policy. There you go. And there's nothing wrong with that. I fit right in here in Florida like that. So uh, I, just things about you can't make this shit up. Nine, 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 one. What's your emergency? <laughs> oh, one, nine, That's what, nine, Murph, if your house burns down, it's going to be, I can't. What's that number again? <laughs> Oh, uh, it's just uh, we have a movie we rate uh, every month. Just come over and check it out and see what you think. I'm, I'm pretty sure you'll be entertained. I'm uh, not pretty sure we know you will be because it's driven by you guys. So, yeah, head on over there, patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. That's where you need to be, all right? Also, head on over to paypal.com if you just feel like a pause for a cause and use our email, Game of Crimes podcast at gmail.com or paypal.me slash Game of Crimes, whatever it makes it easier for you to support the show. But, Steve, we have a disclaimer. And we've got to do this one day in reverb voice. Steve, this is a show about crime. We talk about bad people doing bad things and bad people doing bad things to good people. We take the stories extremely seriously, but, 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 but what? We never take ourselves serious. And it does, you just found out. What's your That's emergency? Right, 119. 119. <laughs> Speaking of that, <laughs> hey, if we're going to, if we're going to call, the other thing you got to do too, the, too, is head on over to our Game of Crimes fans page. It's run by our favorite mafia oh, yeah. queen, Sandy Salvato. Uh, by the way, Murph, she, she kept asking, a lot of people said, are we going to do a road show? We have to talk about that because we've talked about that. She's threatened to feed us until we're like bloated ticks because she's Italian. And if we leave her house and we haven't ate a ton of food, she will be just highly uh, embarrassed and uh, offended. So we have to do it. Well, let me tell you, that right there is enough to go do a road show. Homemade Italian, I'm in. I'm in. Uh, we're in, we're in. So, but head on over there to Game of Crimes fans. Just answer a couple questions. Look, folks, if you got a heartbeat, if you're breathing, you can pass the test. Just give it half an effort, but go join our little thing of ours we call Game of Crimes fans, right? And it, so it Steve, doesn't cost you a thing. Doesn't cost you a thing. Just, just effort, a little bit of effort, right? So before we get started, Steve, I have to ask you, do you know what time it is? I think I know what time it is. What time think, is it? I think it's time for... Small, Small town, town police blotter. By the way, this is a unique one. We have a follow-up from our buddy Steve King, not the Stephen King who wrote all the novels, but uh -huh. his his brother, his other brother, Steve King. Mm -hmm. So Steve, back in episode 50, he gave us a story. Do you remember the guy from Abilene, Texas, who was accused of walking on the wrong side of the road? Um, he couldn't make bond on a jail bond of $94. He couldn't bond out. It was $94. According to the arrest report, they responded to a disturbance call in which they witnessed John David of John Davis of Abilene walking on the right side of the road instead of the left, in which oncoming traffic was coming from behind. I, We kind of theorized that, hey, they probably couldn't get him for that disturbance or whatever else, but they arrested him, right? So yeah. Yeah. He's, a, he's, a, he's a serial offender, Steve. We got an update. That was back <laughs> in May 20th. In September 19th of this year of our Lord, P.A. Sudamine Dane Requiem, 
An Abilene, Texas man was arrested for walking on the wrong side of the road this past week. And according to a arrest report, John Davis was arrested after officials said he failed to walk on the left side of the roadway facing oncoming traffic. This is the second time Davis has been arrested for walking on the wrong side of the road. Transported to Taylor County Jail, he was given a bond of $94 and released the following day. Is there nothing else going on in Abilene, Texas? <laughs> that must be the safest community in the United States. <laughs> Or is that like a police explorer guy out there doing something? Or, uh, <laughs> I've never heard of anybody being given a I'm a moving to Abilene, off. Texas, man. There's just, look, there's Abilene, Kansas by where I grew up, home with Dwight D. Eisenhower. But then Abilene, Abilene, Texas must be the safest damn place in Texas for, say, the biggest story is this. And then they follow it up by saying he had been arrested previously. <laughs> <laughs> well, that boy's a slow learner. Slow learner. Hey, go get them, Abilene. Go get them. Go, go get them. Make the roads safe for us. I, I appreciate it because I, I like, I'd like to keep the roads safe. Anyway, Steve, yeah. guess what? See, what? 5.38 p.m. Police were called to report a suspicious incident in the 2900 block of West Acres Drive, where a woman reported that she had found feces in her toilet that she did not think she put there. Well, okay. But once again, cops out doing a shitty job. <laughs> There was no damage to the house, though, thank God, and no other reason to believe somebody had been inside the house. How old was this person? It did not say. Yeah, probably, yeah. Probably for obvious reasons. Well, in this next story, though, they do give the age. Steve, at 1.51 a.m., a 67-year-old woman called, and Steve, get this, make a note of this, she called 911. Okay, 911. Yeah. Oh, to 67. Report- Go ahead. Just keep dialing. A monkey will get it right soon. A 67-year-old woman called 911 to report that she observed an unknown subject in her house on her security camera. Okay. Upon reviewing the footage with the complainant, it was determined that she saw herself on the footage. (laughs) Might be time to renew that prescription Uh, of your eyeglasses. uh, And disconnect the alarm systems or the surveillance systems in the house. (laughs) I saw somebody. Wait a minute. I put on my glasses. Oh, that's me. Never mind. <laughs> it's, it's like that movie, My Cousin Vinny, where the, the lady's on the witness stand. She's testified about distances, and she puts her glasses, and they like, look like freaking Coke bottles. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you need another thickness. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, hey, man. Mm. That's into the reading for today, man. So, uh. Some silly shit goes on out there. Hey, and thanks to Steve King. Things stay, uh, Steve, uh, not Stephen King, the author, but Steve King. Uh, thanks for that follow-up. It's good to know that John Davis can't get his act together. And Abilene is a safer place because of it. Abilene is the safest place there is. Thank you very Bye. much. All right. That's it for today, but we got to do that to get into this next part of our story, Steve, because this one, this one is historical. First of all, it's a podcast where I can tell you that somebody else has talked far longer than I have. <laughs> <clears throat> and he probably hasn't stopped yet because I know this guy. He has not stopped. We have used his name in vain on many podcasts, uh, and it is time to bring in Derek Maltz. So, Steve, he used to be your boss a um, couple, couple times. We've talked about this, right? So let's 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 let people know about Derek Maltz. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if you've seen anything lately on television on any of the uh, news channels where somebody Dr. gets Phil. up and. Fights, yeah, Dr. Phil. I, I'm impressed that he got on the Dr. Phil show. Uh, that's out still, been retired from DEA for a number of years now, but is still out doing his part to try to fight fentanyl, especially fentanyl that's coming in and poisoning our country. That's Derek Maltz. He's got a strong, he's from Long Island. He's got the Long Island accent, uh, got the Long Island attitude. He, he calls a spade a spade. This guy, when I first went to Special Operations Division, was an assistant special agent in charge over the, the uh, South American Caribbean section. So I worked for him. That's when I first met him. Um, it, it was uh, <laughs> an experience I'll probably never forget because I was the token Southern boy in there. Me and Louis Perez, we were two token Southern guys. Then uh, Derek got promoted, went back to uh, New York, became the eventually became the chief of the New York Drug Enforcement Task Force, which is the oldest task for, drug task force in the United States, and then came back as the special agent in charge of the Special Operations Division. Now, when he came back, I had already been promoted up to where I was running the Mexico Central America section, and Derek came to me one day, and he's like, Murph, I need you to come in to be my executive assistant. 
Now, that's a, a really important sounding title. What that translates to in, prior, in just regular English is, I need you to come up here and be my butt boy. And I tried to turn him down, and you don't turn the boss down. <clears throat> so I did that for a couple of years. A true, <laughs> as you'll hear in today's interview, a true uh, episode of North Meeting South. Just, I love Derek to death like a brother. Uh, know his family. Patty, just the sweetest lady in the world. I don't know how he got her. He must have paid her money because uh, she could have done so much better, Derek. But uh, <clears throat> just, we've been waiting for the right time to bring Derek on. Because this guy, he's one of the most intelligent people I've ever met, one of the most outspoken people. He is uh, anal retentive about everything. When he used to take notes, uh, he kept them. I think it, I think when he left DEA, he had to shred things for a couple of weeks because he had so much stuff saved up, not only on his computer, but as well as hard copies of everything. But his story is phenomenal. The way he got involved in, in uh, uh, narcotics investigations you guys are going to love the story. You're going to love Derek once once this is over, the things that he's involved with now. And just because he's retired from law enforcement, he has not given up the fight. You want somebody to look up to, this is a man you should look up to. Yeah, and if you want some, this is a man on a mission, just like the title. This is a man on a mission to educate people about fentanyl and to get fentanyl, remove fentanyl out of this country. And we get into some stuff, but again, folks, this is history in the making. Somebody who takes a breath and he goes on far longer than I think I ever could, which make (laughs) editing this podcast easy this time is like Derek goes for, you know, 15 minutes and Murph and I ask something for one minute and Derek goes for another 15 minutes. So it makes it easy to do. But we say that in all just because we respect the hell out of the guy. Absolutely. And the biggest area of respect is the fact that he's doing this on his own time, on his own dime to keep getting and educating people about the dangers of China working with Mexico on the importation of all these chemicals to create fentanyl that are poisoning and killing our kids, you know, at an alarming rate. So this is, this is a great episode. This is one you need to share with your children too, to make them understand about the dangers of fentanyl, what it can do to you. So Murph, just before you say way. that, just before yeah. you say that, let me just, before I say that. Yeah. Let me mention this cause it's perfect timing. Yep. October 23rd through the 31st is uh, the annual Red Ribbon Week in which uh, it's the trying to bring awareness to drug prevention in the United States. So it's just apropos that we've got Derek on here at the beginning of October to coincide with Red Ribbon Week. Check it out on Google it. Check out what's going on in your neighborhood. It's all about bringing awareness to our children. What's more important than that? Fits in perfect with, with uh, Derek's interview today. Absolutely. So... Let's hear his interview, Murph, and the way to get to that is now it's time to let me ask you, are you ready to play the biggest, baddest, most dangerous game of all? And this is a dangerous game this time, Game of Crimes. <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm, I'm warning everybody right now, get in, sit down, shut up and hold on, because you're never, <laughs> this is going to be get a face mask <laughs> you've never heard before on Game of Crimes. Bring on Derek Maltz. Love you, brother. Boy, if you guys could know what we're about to do, what we're about to unleash on you. You You have never heard an interview on Game of Crimes like we're going to have today. I'm telling you that right now. And it's like the Yeti, the abominable snowman, Sasquatch. You know he's out there, but nobody's really ever spotted him in the wild. Well, we got him today. We got the guy that who he's name dropped. In fact, before we even showed up, him and I did back-to-back interviews uh, uh, on one of the news shows here recently, and I actually gave him a shout-out saying, my buddy Derek Maltz was right. And so, he, of course, he's right because now he's on Game of Crimes, Derek Maltz. So, welcome. Thank you so much to my friends. It's an honor to be here with you guys. You do a spectacular job. You've had some amazing uh, guests and very interesting investigations Amazing stories for law enforcement around the world. So thank you very much. Hey, this this is this is going to be one for the record books. I'm telling you because I've, I've known this guy for a couple of years now. I've worked what do you for mean him a couple, couple years. A couple. I've had to work for him a couple of times. And this is and this is if you don't remember anything else today, this is a true story of North meets South, right, Derek? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. And so I'm the uh, you know I'm obviously the Yankee, and Murph's the redneck, and. We worked very closely together for years, and we had a great time we moving did. the ball forward, trying to help keep the country safe. But it was a lot of fun, and I appreciate what you guys do now post-government you know, work, Murph. And uh, 
And Morgan, I know I've known you for a long time. Actually, you still, I will never forget going to one of my first meetings with Morgan. <laughs> he was the information sharing coordinator in the Beltway. What a project that was. What a disaster for any human being. And Morgan did a phenomenal job. I actually left going, wow, that guy is smart. I got to get to know that guy. And now look, all these years later on the podcast, it's great. You know, and the best thing about Morgan, well, actually the best thing about Kansas is that Morgan left. Hey, hey. (laughs) Well, that's high praise coming from you considering you only attended two of my meetings and then you said, I got to get out of here. I can't stand this anymore. Hey, Morgan, if we have time, I want to tell you the the backside story of that, which would be very interesting to you uh, because it was a very serious topic at the time. But uh, if we have time, I I want to get into that later. We'll get we'll get into that, but hey, look, let's do like we do with everybody. It's kind of it's kind of our thing. How did you get involved in this thing of ours? We call you know Cosa Nostra for law enforcement. How did you what what? How did you get involved in this? Did you have family, friends, uncles? You know what made you decide that? Hey, man, this is the route I want to take. Well, and tell everybody too what part of the South you grew up in. So I grew up in Alabama. I was born and raised, as you can hear from my accent. Actually, my father was a very dedicated and I would say legendary DEA agent. He worked most of his career in New York on the streets, did undercover work, was very dedicated. Actually, he took two weeks vacation in like 30 years of the DEA. He was really a workaholic, over the top, like crazy, obsessive. But when I was growing up in the household, he was never home. My parents got divorced. And my brother went off to the Air Force, later died in, Afri- in Operation Enduring Freedom. But my father was so dedicated. And, you know, I never really had any aspirations to go into law enforcement. I was following my brother's footstep as an accountant. And then my father kind of pushed me into the field. It's kind of an interesting story. I mean, like back in the old days, you know, if you knew somebody, it really helped you get into the process. And I didn't have any experience. He filled out my application for the DEA. He said, hey, kid, sign this thing. You're going to be a DEA agent. I'm like, really? So when I was in college, I went down. uh, I was playing lacrosse at Syracuse. We had a game at Rutgers University in New Jersey. He sent a DEA agent, Billy Delinsky, to pick me up in the government vehicle, bring me to the interview. I'm like, an interview for what? So I go into the interview. Obviously, it was a panel interview uh, with some really legendary agents in New York. Wait a minute. uh, Now, are you still dressed in your lacrosse outfit? No, no, of course (laughs) not. But I went in there and I was like, you know, immature kid with no real world experience and just doing what my my, my father wanted me to do. And actually, when I went through the interview, I didn't do too well because they recognized I didn't have real world experience. They didn't want to they really didn't want to approve my next step in the process. My father was so intimidating. He literally probably threatened to kill someone. And you're not going to stop my kid from being hired. And ultimately, I got into the process. And I have to say this, Morgan, 28 years in the DEA, I don't regret one day. I woke up every day with the passion to do the job. The men and women of the DEA, the law enforcement agencies, the experiences that it offered me, it's tremendous. And I I thank God my father's no longer alive, but I thank God he, he got me to the field. One very interesting story is... He ran the largest and oldest drug task force in America, in New York City, with the NYPD and the uh, state police and DEA. He ran it for 11 years. And when I was getting promoted, you know, in 2003, 2004 timeframe, Karen Tandy put me in my father's seat. So I was actually the chief of the New York task force, which was really like the best thing that could ever happen to me in my life until, of course, I got the special operations division. Yeah. And... He's jumping Steve, way he's like ahead, a fire man. and forget missile. I mean, I know, just, man. one question is like, okay. <laughs> we got to put this in reverse and go back. I want, you got to tell Morgan and our listeners the story. When you were growing up and your dad was an agent, he's working cases in, in the Big Apple. Who was in the car with him a lot of times? Great point, Murph. So I'll tell you a really good story. My father uh, was chasing a lot of um, heroin violators with the Italians back in the day that were working with the black violators up in Harlem and in Brooklyn and stuff like that. And they had a fugitive. He was an African-American guy. He was a fugitive. And one Saturday night, he asked me if I wanted to go on surveillance with him. And I really didn't want to go, but I didn't want to say no. If you look at my father, you'll understand why. So I get in the car with a buddy of mine, and we're sitting in a Burger King. I was 13 years old. 
in Baldwin, New York, right off the Southern State Parkway in a parking lot for hours watching a house. There was no activity. It was boring as hell. I'm a hyper kid. I'm sitting in the back of the car and my father's trying to explain what we're doing. We're waiting for somebody to come to the house so we could follow them somewhere. Maybe we could find a fugitive. And my friend and I are like, what are we doing here? Anyway, you know, several hours later, an old Cadillac, I'll never forget. It was like a 1976 Cadillac pulls up and uh, a black female gets out. She goes into the location. So he was real excited because this was going to actually maybe lead to something. So she came out of the house, a couple of kids. We followed them to a movie theater in Hempstead. She dropped them off and we're in the back seat. We're excited. The adrenaline's going. And we follow them to a very bad area, Far Rockaway, right by the beach. And it was really, really a dangerous area. And my father actually asked my friend and I, to get out of the car and follow her into the apartment building <laughs> to see if we can actually identify where she's going. What, what apartment? Cause as you know, and Murph knows like you can find, you can follow people to buildings, but if you don't know the apartment, it's very difficult. So we got in the elevator with her. Of course, she didn't pay any attention to us. We were two white kids, young white kids in this very, you know, minority area and we get up to, I'll never forget it, the 11th floor. She gets out. She goes over. I think it was to the left. We jump out. I jump out, go down. We get the apartment, come back downstairs. And by this time, my father had called out the troops. So his call sign on the radio was 701. I was now 701 and a half. So he puts me on the radio in the government vehicle. And I put out 701 and a half to all units. We put the uh, target in apartment 11D. And it was fascinating because it was so exciting. But then what really was terrible is then the rest of the night, there was nothing happening. We're sitting in the car and we were waiting for some big arrest or whatever, and nothing happened. But it was actually a very cool experience. And I, I remember it vividly, but it just goes to show you the old DEA and the current DEA, you know, you can't put your kids in government vehicles <laughs> and you certainly don't want to put your kids in a dangerous situation like that. Or on the radio. I can't imagine that you're sitting there going, who the hell is 701 and a half? <laughs> yeah, but nobody, yeah, so, yeah, it's a, it's a story. Nobody's going to question his dad. Yeah, they, no one would question him. And it, back in those days, there was a lot of camaraderie on the streets. The guys coming out on a Saturday night to go try to arrest this fugitive, of course, they didn't get the fugitive that night. He never showed up to that apartment. That's what they were hoping for. But it was fun. How old were you? 13. <laughs> so my, oh, let me back up. Because actually my career didn't start at 13. In 1972, okay, when I was nine years old, my father's partner, Tommy Devine, was shot in the back and was paralyzed for 10 years. So when I was like nine years old, my father took me to the rehab hospital in New Jersey to see his partner. It was a drug ripoff in, in Manhattan in a hotel. They tried to rip off the money. And Tommy got shot in the back. Of course, his partner was killed in the shooting. Anyway, I get to the hospital, and I do remember seeing this guy sitting in the bed, you know, in his gown, and, and he wasn't moving because he was paralyzed. I mean, I was a young kid, and it kind of was ingrained in my brain like, Oh my God, this is dangerous. The man got shot. And then he, he lived for 10 years and then he later died. I think it was in 19, uh, I'm trying to remember 1982, but it was like a 10 year span. But that's actually when my DEA career started in my mind, because it probably planted the seed in my brain. Like, wow, this is kind of cool. And as my brain was growing and developing, that probably influenced me, which I didn't even know about. Wow. Wow. I can't I can't believe this. Derek is the youngest guy on the podcast if he was only nine in nineteen seventy two. Did you get did your dad give you a gun? Never had a gun, never really showed me the gun, although I never forget one day he actually took out his thirty eight and he actually took out all the bullets and let me hold the gun. He didn't put the, you know, the barrel back in, whatever it's called. You know what I'm saying? Cylinder. The cylinder, the cylinder yeah. yeah. Sorry, I'm not a gun guy. I mean, they're good to have. They're, they're very handy, but that's not my thing. But it was like, it was wild. But then, by the way, because you brought it up, Murph, he sent me to the range with one of the guys in the task force before my, you know, my, my Quantico, uh, you know, training. I never shot a gun up to that point. He never took me to shoot. 
And the first time I shot the gun, it was amazing to see the power of a, of a pistol. Right. And to see like, you know, it was, it was just amazing. And, and I, I did okay. Cause you know, I had pretty good hand and eye coordination and that was like my first time ever shooting a gun. But my father had another DEA guy bring me to the range. You know, it's funny because you said that you, you know, you're out with your dad there on that boring surveillance. You were a hyperactive kid. You're a hyperactive man. You Nothing has changed. <laughs> what do you mean, kid? Yeah. <laughs> so, Murph, let me address that. Um, I have a, a, a famous thing that I've done over the years because a lot of people who know my father know how crazy he was in a good way. He's a good crazy, okay? Very passionate, good crazy guy. So I would routinely hold up his photograph to his friends and say, you know this guy? Well, I have his DNA. How is it possible for me to be calm and normal growing up with this guy as a father? Now, I'm proud of the guy. I love him to death, but it's impossible. So I have an excuse. I have his DNA. I tell you what, I, and I, I got to, you know, <laughs> over the years, I've gotten to be friends with a lot of the guys in New York City, a lot through Derek. I mean, some of the finest law enforcement professionals in the world, Fed and state and local, are in New York City. I mean, it's just amazing. Love those guys. But uh, when we go up to the the DEA office up there, and and especially later in my career, I was Derek's executive assistant, which you know I refer to as his butt boy because I had to do all the crap he didn't want to do, and that's fine because you took you know what the job was going into it. But we'd go to New York, or the guys from New York would come down, and, and you know they find out the position I'd held. And, and they'd say, you know, Derek's dad. And I said, well, I've never met him, but I've heard a lot of stories. I've seen the pictures. And I'm like, we got to tell you some stories about him. They're, they said, when we're duty agent, like the young agents, are, you had to be on duty. You know, there was always a duty agent in the building with a uh, radio base in New York City. And they said, you're sitting in there and it's quiet in the building. All of a sudden you hear this thumping noise just up. And they're like, what the hell is that? Is the building haunted? You know, so eventually the duty agent, he'll get his gun out and he'll go walk the building to see what's going on. You get in the gym and there's Derek's dad in there exercising in the middle of the night. And the thump was coming from where he was pounding his hands, his 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 knuckles on the concrete to create calluses on his knuckles. This is a tough guy. I mean, yeah. he's an old time tough guy. So it's funny you bring that up because it happened to me. I was working as a duty agent on, in 555 57th Street one day, and I heard the same thing. I went over there. The lights were out. He's on the ground punching the floor. But I knew as a kid growing up in the house, in our basement, it wasn't finished, and there was blood all over the cement foundation in the basement because he would go downstairs, and he would punch the wall repeatedly <laughs> to his knuckles were bleeding. And Jimmy Craig, a former DEA executive, one day brought up a question to my father and said, hey, chief, why are you always punching the floor and the walls? What's the reason? He said, Jimmy, because when I hit the son of a bitch, I want him going down. I got to be ready. And he routinely would punch the wall, punch the floors, and he controlled the gym in the New York office. As a matter of fact, this is really cool. When John Gilbride was a SAC at DEA, they named the uh, first ever Federal Foundation Leadership Award for DEA, the John Maltz Leadership Award. And that, that was when he was still alive. But then Frank Tarantino, the current SAC, is now making uh, a dedication to my father and naming the gym after my father. He controlled the New York DEA gym, well, him and Mike Levine. But here's the thing. If guys came in the gym and they turned on music, he'd pull the plug out. If guys were sleeping in the old bunk beds in New York in the gym, he'd throw them out. That guys were divorced and they wanted a place to sleep, he would throw them out because that was his place. And you don't talk to the chief when he was working out. And he had the same jeans. He had the blue shirt with the, the belt, which was a rope. And he used to wear his headset because he didn't want to hear any noise. He just wanted to do his thing. And no one messed with the chief, but there's a million chief stories. But one last thing on this, because it's important to give you some background on what I was dealing with and what everyone dealt with. When my father passed away, I heard so many John Malt stories for the first time. About two years after he died, I sent out a message to all the former uh, narcotics agents in AFNA. And I asked if anybody had any cool stories, I want to share them with my kids, their grandfather. And uh, I wound up getting about 55 pages of a Word document of stories. I have it right now. I can make a, a sitcom based on the stories. And I, I put the document together. I took out all the names to protect all the people, the sources. And I, say, I shared it with my kids. I said, here's your grandfather. This is what he was about. So I have that document, and it's kind of cool. 
I wish I would have done it sooner so I would have got like 200 pages of stories. So we got a quick rule. Oh, you got to define acronyms. So you said AFNA. AFNA is the, it's the Association of Former Narcotics uh, Association. It's all the former DEA guys and task force officers that work and have dedicated their lives. And it's an association that's been around for many years. And just, you know, to clarify one thing too, Morgan, when Derek says he has the document, the guy's got every freaking document that anybody ever, if you handed him a piece of paper when he was two years old, he still got it in a file somewhere. Look, I'm telling you, I've never right seen now. Hey, Murph, <laughs> you'll be proud of this because I've been asked repeatedly, are you going to ever write a book? I said, no, nah, I'm not a book guy. But I was so bored during COVID, I actually copied and pasted and wrote. I got 360-something pages here of cool stories that have happened. And this is the point about this. If, if the average person read this, they wouldn't believe what goes on inside the government and the lack of cooperation and the cool stuff that the law enforcement does. You know, I always used to say, you know, despite all the obstacles, law enforcement is so relentless and so passionate about public safety, they get around it. They figure out ways to get the job done. And that's something that I've always been impressed with over the years. Especially I, in I, DEA. How long did it take you to write that document there? You know what, Murph? I, it wasn't that long because I had a lot of stuff already written. Uh, and, and I just kind of, and, and by the way, for the record, like I can't give this right now to a publisher and let them do it because it's, it's, it's in Yankee language. You know what I mean? I have to fine tune it, but I did print it out so I could give it to my kids. So if something happened to me tomorrow, they have a document of what their old man was doing. And there's one clarification we need to make. It, you know, we talk about North meets South and you said you were the Yankee. No, you're a damn Yankee because you didn't go back. You're a Yankee if you go back. You're a damn Yankee when you come south and you stay. That's good. <laughs> I've stayed here for 15, well, 17 years now, and we like living in Virginia, so. Yeah, but um, nice. let, let's rewind just a minute because I like the way you didn't call I took their names out. You're still, you're still in the game. You say, I removed all the sources, sources and methods. <laughs> it, no, no, no sources in my. Uh, well, dude, I protected sources and methods my whole career. That's what you had to do at SOD. Uh, cause you want to make sure that you could get the job done. And we had so many obstacles. That's part of the game. And SOD stands for special operations division. Sorry about that. That won't happen again. My bad. <laughs> okay. And if it does happen again, I, I'm not going to stop you. So, uh, <laughs> hey, let me see, before we get started, let me see your knuckles. They, they look pretty. You, you yeah. My look knuckles don't look like the old man's. I could tell you that. Yeah, but if you I ask, wasn't punching walls. You need to check Patty's, his wife's knuckles. She might punch him out every once in a while. Yeah, I got, I got, I got this guy. Well, let's, we kind of jumped forward a little bit, but let's go back a little bit. So what, uh, when you, you went through your interview and you said you weren't even sure you're going to pass it, your dad kind of talked him into it. So it sounds like eventually you got, obviously you got on DEA. When did you get on DEA? So 1986, I got on DEA and I was very cognizant of the fact that I had to prove myself. I had to keep my mouth shut. And not, never bring up my father. The first day I was at DEA Academy in Quantico, I'll never forget it. One of the counselors was sitting in the back of the room. I was trying to keep it quiet about my father. And he asked the question. Every, every student had to get up there and say who they are and everything like that, their background. So I talked about it. Of course, I didn't mention anything about my father. And this guy raises his hand. He says, excuse me, uh, Mr. Maltz. Do you have anybody that is worked in the DEA or know anybody in the DEA? So, of course, I had to disclose to my classmates at that moment. But that was even more important for me to just continue to do the best I could do to prove that it wasn't just my father, you know, getting me on the job. I had to, you know, earn some respect on my own. And that continued, by the way. When I got out of Quantico, I had like eight guys in my class and we were all signed back to the New York office. My father was the associate sack at the time with Kevin Gallagher and Bob Stutman, and they didn't know where to assign Derek Maltz because they didn't want me to be close to John or in the same building. So here's a good one for you. The Long Island office was like a country club back in the day. Every age in, in the world wanted to go to Long Island to get out of the madness of New York and the commuting and the traffic. What happened was I didn't get my assignment. All my buddies got their assignments. And then later in the day, my father comes out of the front office. He gives me a thumbs up and he comes over. He goes, I got you to Long Island. I said, Pop, I didn't want to go to Long Island. I want to work in Manhattan where the action is. So now I had to go to Long Island and I was under microscope because all these old timers in New York DEA were ready to kill me because how is this possible? This kid comes on board and he's assigned to Long Island. I've been waiting 10 years. 
So now the pressure came even higher on me because now if I sucked as an agent, okay, it would be really bad for my father. So I was deathly afraid to embarrass my father and his reputation was so solid, I had to work even harder. But it was great because that office, we turned it around. I had some unbelievable senior guys. I had unbelievable like state and local, Suffolk County, Nassau County that helped teach me the foundation of the job. And being at the Long Island office gave me, I believe, a, a wider diversity of experience touching all different things like doing undercover, going to do grand jury testimony, going to trials, working with all these agencies. You don't always learn that when you work in a big office. So it actually helped my career. I always say, if you're going to build a foundation, if you're going to build a skyscraper, you have to have solid foundation. My foundation was built by these unbelievable agents and task force officers on Long Island. So I never will forget what they've done for me. And and not to, I just want to back up just for a second because you kind of skipped over your college career. Did you play any sports at uh, what's that place called? Sarah Gross. what? Sarah, Sarah Lee? yeah. So so I knew you were going to do this to embarrass me, but as a proud father, I'm going to tell you a quick story. I walked on to the Syracuse team, 1982, 1983. We won the first ever national championship for Syracuse. We were then Syracuse was in the final four, 22 years in a row. After that, we were in the finals three years in a row in lacrosse. Well, years later, my son wanted to follow my footsteps. He went to Syracuse. He went and played on the team. He made it to a national championship game. They lost to Duke. My other son, Dylan, my middle son, went up there, and he played with his brother for one year. Then he transferred to Maryland. He went to the final game three years in a row, and his senior year, he won the championship. My youngest kid, Daniel, he, he went to Maryland. He went to the final game in the first year as a freshman. He lost to University of Virginia. Uh, by one goal. And then last year, they won the championship, uh, his first championship. So our family has three goals and six silver in lacrosse. So that really has been a tremendous part of my life because it's it's special. Like anyone knows who has kids, to watch your kids do anything is really cool. So thanks for bringing that up, Murph. No, because I know the story there, and I know you're proud of it. And it even made the uh, the media there in Northern Virginia when the oldest son was at Syracuse and they won the championship. I remember reading the article. And if you're from Loudoun County, Virginia, when his when Derek's kids were in school and high school playing lacrosse, if you ever went to a game, everybody knew Derek was there. Everybody (laughs) knew Derek was there because he's on the sideline, running up down the sideline. (laughs) That's a really good point, Morgan. And I've calmed down. I don't I don't do that in the college game at all. But I was a disaster on the sidelines in in the high school. (laughs) I, I was I wasn't like. I didn't. I wasn't like rude to like the players or the refs or anything like that. I was just very intense. You yeah, know, I did the same thing with wrestling. Uh, where, what high school did your kids go to? Stonebridge and then Riverside. Stonebridge. My yeah, kid, baby. My my uh, middle son was in the first graduating class of Stonebridge. Oh wow! Yeah, that's awesome. To our listeners here, you may think I'm I'm kind of busting on Derek here. I'm not. I love this guy like a brother. I'm proud of everything he's accomplished, and I know a lot of his background stories, and that's why I'm bringing these things up because Derek, as outspoken as he is, he is rather humble when it comes to himself. So that's why we're bringing this up But, here. but uh, Derek, just so you know, we refer to Murph as the traitorous bastard because you and I stayed in Loudoun County and Murph moved on us, didn't he? Yeah, he got out of it. He had to go back to Georgia for a while, you know, So and Boys. now he's in Florida. So he's got to get out of the, you know, the north. This is too north for him. That's it, bro. But and then it. again, he was born in West Virginia, right, Murph? No, Tennessee. Oh, Tennessee. But you lived in West Virginia. You were a cop in West Virginia. High school and college, West yes, Virginia. Yes, I'm well aware of that. <laughs> and we won't tell everybody your pet name for me on here. <laughs> uh, oh, <laughs> yes, we will. Murph, you never should have brought it hey, up. Derek, this is explicit. You can say it. Well, Murph's a redneck, you know, and I've been talking about him forever. When I watched Narcos, I used to call him up, say, hey, redneck. Like, did you really do that? You know, I would go over the thing with him. But we, we've we had uh, a friendship for many years, like he said, and he's very nice when he says this, but he had to put up with my madness for like three years straight. How long was it, Murph, as executive assistant? Two to three years? Two years, yeah. Yeah, two years. And God bless him. He came in with a smile every day, and he was very cooperative with everyone at SOD. The interagency loved him because he was really professional, and he got the job done. Derek, 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 we have a couple stories later. We'll talk about <laughs> Paul Crane and Abe Perez. Yeah. <laughs> oh, All good we, people. Oh, but we, we 
we we have a couple things. I don't know if you know this, but Murph actually was a spy. Uh, I cool. wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> for who? For, for Paul Crane. <laughs> uh, you were told Paul slipped you a couple bucks to say, let me know when Derek leaves. Oh. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't doubt it. You remember this, Derek? Remember we put the camera up on the front gate because people were leaving work early. You put the oh, monitor- yeah, of course. I was in the guard booth many times. Well, you put, you put the monitor in my office in the, in the you know, I was sitting back with yes. all the attorneys back then. And Jamie Hunt and, and Paul Crane come up. And they're like, all right, Murph, here's three bucks. Let us know when Derek's leaving so we can get out of here. And it was all a joke because that's how funny it was. It's so funny. Uh, let me tell you that story real quick because he brought up the cameras. So I used to have these guys come up to the front office of SOD and sit out, make like they're reading the newspaper. But they were only going there to listen to what I was saying in my office on the phone because I speak very loud. And they were <laughs> gossiping and spreading rumors around the building. So I had to shut down that, that leak of information. So I had my engineer come up and put a camera outside my office so I could see everything going on in the lobby of the front office of SOD. So I used to sit in there and I could see them coming in and I yell, say, get out of here. Don't come up here and you know spy on me in the front office. Then I had to go down to the guard shack and watch the booths, watch all the cameras in the building to watch all these guys coming in late and leaving early, trying to send a message like I'm watching what you're doing. We're trying to support global law enforcement around the world, and you guys are leaving early. You got to support the guys on the street. You know, this is a headquarters job. You're not going to get shot here. You're going to get a paper cut, but you got to support the guys out in the field. So it used to piss me off. I'm the problem is I also inherited something else from my father. You know, we're like tigers on the outside and pussy cats on the inside. So I, I I never hurt anybody. I wanted to transfer them to the DEA headquarters building to set a, uh, a message across the board. Like they had a privilege of being out at SOD, closer to home, better work hours. We used to get government vehicles at the time and some guys didn't appreciate it, but I was getting pissed off many times, but I never pulled the trigger. I had a memo on one guy one day and my heart didn't let me pull the trigger and, tr- and transfer him. True. This is all true, but it's good stuff. <laughs> but anyway, all right. So now um, let us kind of go back then and start setting the stage. So you're working in Long Island, uh, having fun. How long are you in uh, New York? Uh, what kind of squad are you on before you move up kind of to your next assignment? So I was in the Long Island Task Force Group, and I worked there from 1986 to 1996. So I was there 10 years. I worked very closely with U.S. Customs, Nassau County Police, Suffolk County Police, New York State Police. Those were the main agencies we worked with at the time. And of course, the Suffolk and Nassau District Attorney's offices. And, you know, so we did a lot of different types of stuff. One of my best jobs was I was the liaison agent from, for the uh, Montauk and East Hampton Police. So I'd go out there all the time and hang out oh, in that's Montauk. That's a nice area. That was a great assignment. And we could tell stories all day about that. But anyway, um, and I, after spending the 10 years there, I got promoted to the New York Drug Enforcement Task Force. That was my first supervisor job. And that's another good story with my old man, because Bill Mokler, who's a legend, one of the best agents in the history of DEA, who set up so many different capabilities for the DEA. Bill Mokler was the uh, chief of the task force, and I was trying to get promoted. And there were so many qualified, really experienced agents in New York that were getting promoted ahead of me. My father was getting pissed off. I wasn't as mad because I knew these guys were better qualified. I knew my turn would come. So one day my father was at, because my father used to be Bill Mokler's boss. My father was at a function with Bill Mokler, a retirement function, and he walks over to Mokler, and I'll never forget it. And he says, hey, Billy. He pinches his skin and he says, blood and flesh. And he walks away. And Mokler's like, what the hell is he talking about? Blood and flesh. Well, it was my father's signal to tell Mokler, you better promote the kid the next, the next time around. I'm sick and tired of watching the kid get bypassed. And sure enough, the next job that came up, I was promoted to be a supervisor in the first New York Division South American heroin group in the task force. It was Mokler's vision to start looking at the white heroin that was showing up all over the Northeast that was now coming for the first time ever from Colombia. And so Mokla put me in that seat and I could go on for days in the stories with him because he's another lunatic, but I love him like a father, 
a mentor. He's probably my number one mentor over the years in the DEA. And so many people in the DEA could say the same thing. But he was documented crazy, eccentric, but in a good way again. You know, if this wasn't a, if we didn't know who you were and this wasn't DEA, somebody listening to the outside, this sounds like an episode of The Sopranos. Hey, flesh, blood, you know, right. you gotta, exactly. you gotta do it. <laughs> That's the way he operated. He was very eccentric. He was introverted. That's one trait that I didn't get from the old man. He was super quiet when there was press conferences. He would never get up there on the podium. He would stand in the background. But that's why the cops loved him, because he was more concerned about taking care of his people than, than taking care of himself. Because if you work hard and you're passionate, the cream rises to the top. And you don't have to always pat yourself on the back and talk about what you do. It's about the team. And that's why the old man was very successful, because that was his number one trait, took care of the people that took care of him. You know, and Derek's talking about Bill Moakler. We, we all called him Moak. He is a true legend. I didn't get to meet him until he was already retired, and I came up to work in SOD and, and went to the – the uh, we had these training classes that SOD would put on that teach police officers how to run wiretaps. And I went to that class, three-day class, and afterward I came out. I'm like, why in the hell didn't I get this in the academy? I mean, it's one of the best training classes i ever been in. Well, then I get stationed in SOD – I'm working for Derek in the uh, Caribbean South American section for about a year and a half. And then the boss at the time, Joe Keefe, who was, a, Derek was my assistant special agent charge. I'm, I'm first level supervisor. He's second. And Joe Keefe was our boss, the special agent charge. So Joe, you, he was my rabbi coming up through the ranks. And uh, he called me up and he said, Murph, I need you to take over the training unit for SOD. And I'm like, yeah, I don't want to do that, Joe. I'm pretty happy where I am. And he's like, yeah, okay, you're going to start Monday. <laughs> you don't really give a shit. Voluntold. Well, then Mokler, and the reason I'm telling you the story is uh, when I took over the class, they, the SOD, and this is true wisdom, hired these retired legends to come in and teach the class. And Moak was the, he was the leader of this group. And we had John Sager, who was retired NYPD and the uh, New York Drug Enforcement Task Force. Uh, there was like four or five of these guys and just hanging out with them, just to go to, to lunch or dinner with these guys was an honor, to be quite honest with you. But then to learn from them and, and just because they're retired, it's like I say, just because you retire doesn't mean your oath ever expired. And these guys, to this day, I'm still, I'm sure, are still doing something to promote law enforcement and the good things in this country. I mean, it's yeah, just- like Jerry Spezial, he's like the chief of Patterson. He's a, he he works as like the director of police in in uh, Hazleton, Pennsylvania. He's out there every day on the streets, and he was one of our training instructors. And he's another former NYPD legendary detective, John Sager. All these guys, they were like incredible. But that was good old times with the training. It was very important. As communications, uh, the technologies were evolving, these guys were keeping us in the game. Yeah, so let's let's go back to your promotion now. So the flesh, blood, the, the message was delivered, so you get promoted. What's that next level of promotion? Is that... Um uh, what, what the, you know, is that the GS 13 level? No, GS 14 frontline supervisor. So, uh, Bill Mokla handpicked the best and brightest detectives and state police investigators to work with me to go attack this brand name heroin that was all over the streets of New York. He had the vision to be able to show that the 90% heroin being sold in these bags for $10 on the streets were very close to the source of supply in Columbia. So through the targeting plan we had with wiretaps and working with the state locals, identifying all the locations in Manhattan, we were able to easily go up the chain to the heroin mills, to the Colombian suppliers, and then the supply network in Colombia. The work that we did eventually led to the extradition of Jaime Lara, who was involved with you know, importing hundreds of kilograms of heroin into the New York area. And you got to remember... This was a new thing for the Colombians. You know, historically, it was cocaine, obviously. They got involved for a while with white heroin because of the profit potential. Now, the Colombians were so smart over time, just like they did with cocaine, they, they turned over the distribution responsibilities of heroin and cocaine to the Mexican cartels because they didn't want the risk and the vulnerabilities of being extradited and charged in America because DEA had done so many great cases over the years bringing in some of these biggest and baddest traffickers out of Colombia, as Murph knows very well. Um, but 
that was a really good experience. That provided so much knowledge to me that I had. Look, I was a Long Island kid. I didn't even know what a glassine bag of heroin was. But under Mokler, I had to become an expert really quick. And in Mokler, because he's a legendary mentor as well, he would bring me on the road shows. He would bring me to Washington to brief the administrator, to all the, the executives of DEA at their SAC conferences, special agent in charge conferences. So I would go on the road shows and do this heroin briefing about how we were doing this. And it was really fascinating. And that gave me a lot of uh, experience and exposure, which helped me, of course, down the line to get promoted and to get into these good operational positions in Washington. Well, I don't know. Did you have something, Murph? No, I could. I, well, I was going to say, um, I forgot what I was going to say. There's something about Mokler now. <laughs> well, you think about it right now. He'll remember. He's a little older, Morgan, so he forgets stuff. See, Steve, I use what's called a yellow pad. I write uh -huh. stuff down so I don't forget it. Uh, for and I, have, I have a secret message I'm sending you right now on the video. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> a good one. Number of friends left in Florida, I think it was. So, um, but you're, so you're operating in New York during this. And that was interesting too, because everybody always associated the Colombians with cocaine, heroin. So what were some of the cases, what some of the impact you had on making these cases, um, you know, with heroin, how did you, uh, you know, how broad did it go? How long did it go before you moved on to your next assignment? So I just want to back up quickly because when I was at Long Island, I was also uh, fortunate to get involved with a lot of Southwest Asian heroin cases out of Pakistan and, and Afghanistan and actually made a couple of trips over to uh, Pakistan to bring back heroin and do controlled deliveries. But so I was able to get a little of experience on that type of heroin. Of course, it wasn't as pure. It wasn't as addictive. And the Southwest Asians did not have a distribution outlet like the Colombians. The Colombians had their Dominican distribution networks all over the Northeast and everything. So they were able to easily move the new product of, of, of heroin. So we, we started seeing the expansion of the white heroin supply in America, especially like New York, New Jersey, New England, Philadelphia, you know, down like into like Washington, D.C. area. And they started dominating and Ohio, they started spreading out west. And we would do these wiretap operations and then pass leads to all these different field divisions looking to make the biggest bang for the buck by indicting and, ex you know, arresting and then ultimately extraditing, you know, the highest level targets. And we were very successful at hitting the heroin mill operations. Now, of course, you got to remember, Morgan, you're only as good as your people. So when I was the frontline supervisor, I had some of the best detectives in the history of the NYPD. And they were teaching me everything. I didn't know a thing, but I was there to support them. And I was getting hit from the top because the crazy man Mokler was beating me down every day for results. And then I was dealing with these lunatic detectives, uh, very high speed. Actually, I went to the hospital as a GS, thought I was dying because of the stress and the anxiety of, of working in that environment with these, these lunatics. And I say that in a New York loving way. They were not lunatics. They were very amazing patriots that were trying to keep the country clean from drugs. But I actually was having these vasovagal attacks where I thought I was having a big one. And the doctor told me in the hospital after being admitted to St. Francis Hospital, he said, look, guy, it's your lifestyle. You, you, your heart's great. He goes, we kept you overnight. Everything's cool. You know, we did all the, you know, sophisticated, you know, table tilt tests and all this stuff. And he said, you just got to calm down. I said, Doc, that's a problem. I can't calm down. I only know one speed. He goes, well, I'm just telling you, you got to calm down. So it was all that adrenaline that was building up in my body from these lunatic detectives, not following the rules, not listening to me. So it was a lot of stress. But anyway, I got out of there after three years. And, it, and I say got out of there because I don't know if I could have lasted four or five years because it was so intense. When I got down to Washington, Joe Keefe, who Murph talked about, another legend. And I, I put that in quotes because he took care of so many people and he was silent and very, very uh, gr a great leader. He took me down to SOD to give me an opportunity to work at SOD. And that was in 1999. And so I was a staff coordinator, GS-14, that worked in the Latin America Caribbean section. So I was able to do a lot of work with Columbia and overseas offices on this whole heroin problem. Hey, Derek, real quick, when you when you said you were over in Pakistan, what areas did you go to? I was in Pakistan, too. 
I went to Karachi, Lahore, and Islamabad, and on one particular case, actually with the current sheriff of Loudoun County, Mike Chapman, we did a joint investigation, and they had an informant over there that was uh, that took possession of 20 kilograms of heroin at the time, which was an amazing amount. And the bad guys in Peshawar, Pakistan, up on the border, wanted the heroin delivered to New York so they could get it sold to the customers on Long Island and New York City and Queens and stuff. And so we transported the 20 kilograms of heroin, myself and Mike, and then we set up all these controlled delivery operations. It was an amazing experience. Yeah. Do you ever... So did you work for a while out of Islamabad? Because that's that was that area. No, 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 no. I was scared to death. I wouldn't even stay one night in Islamabad. I, I got the hell out of there. I told Chapman, I said, I'm out of here. Just get me on a plane. I want to go home. <laughs> and then I'm sitting in the airport in Islamabad. No, in Karachi it was. And we're sitting with 20 kilograms of heroin waiting to get the final approval to get on the plane to, to Paris. And these guys are looking at us and everyone in the airport knows who we are and what we're doing. And they're running around with their, you know, their machine guns and everything. And I was scared to death. I'll be honest with you. I was happy to get the hell out of there. Well, even in 2005, they made us land. We were doing some work over there. They made us land. And we were like a mile away from the terminal. They brought out a bus with two, what they call technicals, pickup trucks with 50 calibers on there. (laughs) And the plane was only on the ground for two hours, a British Airways plane. So we got, we had to hustle. We had to get off. They took us to the uh, uh, terminal. That's where we collected our bags. As we were getting off the bus, the other people were getting on the bus. Literally, that's I think it was a seven that seven forty seven was on the ground for less than two hours, a mile away from the term. And that's in two thousand five when things were supposed to be good. Yeah, with, with Pakistan. Anyway, I digress. We have a drinking game, so anytime I side day, I say I digress and back to our regularly scheduled podcast. Curtis of Alex Campbell, we give him credit for that. Uh, you get to take a drink. So it's early in the day for us, but you never know. Uh, well. <laughs> What's in that thing? That's all I want to know, man. It's only cold water, buddy. It's too yeah. early to drink. <laughs> How would I know? That could be gin, vodka, whatever. Anyway, that's true. Your drink of choice. So, but let's talk about then going to SOD. So, um, at that time, when did SOD actually start? When did SOD actually become a thing? Well, it was formed as a division in like 1994. Some brilliant people, including Bill Mokler, had the vision. Bobby Nieves, John Wallace, Mary Lee Warren, so many people. I'm going to forget people as I go down the list. But there were so many great Americans that realized that the Cali and Medellin cartel were beating us bad. And they were using very advanced types of communication techniques. And they needed to create a capability that can further infiltrate them. And it was all being driven at that time by the New York Drug Enforcement Task Force, Bill Mokler, was running the divisions of all these guys who were attacking the cartels. And so they, they formed this capability, classified capability, in Washington, in, in the original location down in Lawton, Virginia. Ultimately, it, it, it became a division down in Lawton. And uh, it was a very small, compartmentalized operation at the time. And uh, when I got down there on Morgan, I got down there in 1999, and Joe Keefe was the head. And we were starting to build up some some momentum at the time with the interagency, because at that time, before 9-11, you had FBI working the Mexican cartels, you had U.S. Customs at the time, and you had DEA, and there was a lot of, you know, banging heads, and everyone was trying to, you know, do their own thing in the silos, and Joe Keefe was trying hard to pull everyone together, and I was, I was provided a, a golden opportunity because my bread and butter was always interagency operations. Because the old man taught me, like, you, you're not going to, you're never going to accomplish your goal if you're not working with other experts because everyone brings something to the table. And I learned that firsthand with the cops in New York City. Like, they knew everything. They taught me everything. The cops on Long Island, like, I never would have been where I am today without the foundation that they helped me build. But so when I got to SOD, Unfortunately, Morgan, even at that time, SOD was a bit under attack by insecure people in Washington that wanted the attention on them and they didn't want this operation growing. What defined insecure people? Who did they work for? Well, multiple agencies like DOJ, DEA, right? FBI, all the competitive agencies did not want to see this DEA led operation succeed. Sadly, you would think it's for the American public safety 
But that's mm-hmm. not how it works, especially prior to 9-11. Mm-hmm. Okay? It was all about turf, and it was all about who's going to make the biggest case, who's going to get in the press, who's going to get the budget. So at that time, you know, I was learning all this stuff in Washington because that was my first experience in Washington. So Joe Keefe as the boss was phenomenal. And then after working for Joe as a staff coordinator, he promoted me to a GS-15 as the section chief running the Latin America Caribbean section. So that was really cool. And it only took after a year because my current boss at the time, Marty Proct, who was my GS-15, he was asked to come to DEA headquarters by the administrator, Donnie Marshall. So it created a vacancy at SOD and Joe Keefe promoted me. Now, one, one other thing. Can't hear you, Morgan. You're muted. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm muted. Uh, I did that uh, out of respect because <laughs> it was my cats are at it again. No, hey, what I was going to say is, um, when did your dad retire from DEA? Can't hear you more. I can't hear you, Der- Derek. Hey, what I want to do is just insert real quick. Uh, when did your dad retire from DEA? I kind of want to know where your careers overlapped at. When, when did he when did he finally uh, end his tour? 1994, and he only retired because they had mandatory retirement at age 57. And here's another story about the old man. What happened with him was he refused to leave that office on his last day on a Friday because it was too emotional for him. And I had to go in there on a Saturday after the office was vacated to get all his boxes and move them out. And that was in, in 1994. So I was, I was, uh, you know, overlapping him several years. Wow. You know what? And that's, I mean, that's a testament to your dad's dedication and sacrifices for the government, for the citizens of the United States that he, he can't leave the building. I, you know, I just, he couldn't leave the building. And I was deathly afraid that he would like maybe contemplate hurting himself or something Mm -hmm. because he was all alone. His kids were all grown up. And then he lived his life through me. He actually cried when I, I'll tell you that story when we get to it. I don't want to jump ahead. When I got promoted to the uh, DEA task force and, and he actually cried on the phone. And I'll tell you that story when we get to it. Wow. Uh, and that's got to be hard, too, because you've lived all your life doing that. And it's kind of like it's kind of like, you know, different. But you, you've seen those. I've been on the planes a couple of times where the pilots taking their last flight. They're mm-hmm. coming in. They've got the water cannons and stuff, you know, and they make a big deal. And it's, you see these guys after you've done something you love for so long to be told you, you're, when you don't want to, when you're not leaving on your terms, but you have to leave on somebody else's terms, it's kind of like, it's a tough thing to do. I mean, they're, <laughs> I was joking one time uh, and this is not political folks. Don't, don't go down there, but it was joking because you know how much Bill Clinton loved the white house and air force one. And he took air force one back to Arkansas. I said, it's going to take a SWAT team to get that guy out of the white house and out of air force one, <laughs> because there are some people who just love what they do so much, obviously like you, but so let's talk about that now. So you get promoted to uh, GS 15. Now in the rank structure, we've talked about it. GS government service 15. That is the final step before you become a member of what they call the senior executive service, right? Right. And so I was fortunate to get promoted. Then I worked for another legendary DEA executive, Mike Ferguson. Mm -hmm. He became the uh, head of the special operations division. Joe Keefe became the chief of operations. But backing up, one other guy that I want to highlight because he was another important mentor in my career, it was Richie Fiano. Richie Fiano was the chief of operations when Joe Keefe was in charge of SOD. I, 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 ran, I met Richie over here at the sheriff's office when he went to work for Mike running investigations there. First time, mm-hmm. he looked so uncomfortable in a uniform. Yeah. First time I saw him in a uniform, it's like, <laughs> do you know he's, how to investigate a burglary? <laughs> he's a great guy. I mean, he pulled me in. He's the one that got me to SOD. Joe Keefe recommended me. He made it happen. And he's I've always looked up to him for years. Another gentleman who took care of people over the years and was always very loyal to the mission and the agency. But anyway, so Mike Ferguson was there. I was a GS-15. Now it became a very difficult decision for me because my wife was was pregnant with my my last son. And now I wanted to go back out to the field. And it was a very, very um, delicate situation. Um, So I don't want to get into all of it, but I had an opportunity to go back and be assistant special agent in charge of the New York division. And so, you know, going back to New York, you know, with my wife and, and, and my family, you know, we, we knew the area so we could live there. So we went back up there. I took the job as the ASAC in New York division 40. 
And we lived in New Jersey at the time because I couldn't take the cross Manhattan traffic anymore. So I came on on the west side instead of going in through the tunnel on the what east year, side. What year was that? That was in the year 2002. Which is pretty close to when we're going to start crossing paths here pretty soon, because I think you were the ASAC in New York when we had our meetings, when we started this project right. down at Justice. Exactly. So I'll get to that. So what I left out was I was in SOD during 9-11, and it was very surreal because I came into the office, the TV was on in my office, and we all watched it together. We were just absolutely disgusted, and um, it, it was you can't even describe the feeling overwhelming feeling, just those poor people getting crushed to death in, into ashes in the building. And of course, knowing so many people in New York, I was very emotional. And what happened was we also watched firsthand the chaotic environment in Washington, D.C. with the information sharing. And SOD had to step up and become the 24-hour command center for DEA headquarters. So Joe Keefe took immediate leadership. We all worked together to try to support the FBI and the intel community any way we could. And we had some really interesting capabilities there. And we were able to identify some really interesting stuff and pass some leads out. So it opened up the eyes of everyone in the interagency community that we need to use this SOD more in, in addition to drug investigation. So the reason I tell that story is because in 2002, okay, before I got back there, they formed the first ever special coordination unit at SOD because of the leadership of Joe Keefe. And Bob Mueller from the FBI and the DEA administrator signed a MOU to actually, and the attorney general, to form the first ever special coordination unit at SOD to be able to better deconflict and coordinate and synchronize efforts on any drug cases in the world that had a nexus to terrorism. Because DEA was global and we had the largest law enforcement criminal investigative presence, it was critical that DEA had a system of coordination of this information. We did not want anything to fall through the cracks. And we had informant networks. We had SIU special investigation units around the world doing wiretaps. So these guys set up the unit in 2002. Now, I'm up in New York at this point, and my brother's in the Air Force. And then I remember getting the call. He was so excited. My brother, Mike, he was in the pararescue unit training his whole career. He had his paperwork in to retire. He had young kids at the time and his wife. And he was so excited to finally go to Afghanistan to do God's work and go after the, uh, the you know, the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. And so he went over there. He was deployed into action around 2002. And so the reason I bring that up, because I believe this was a life-changing experience for me and why God put me in these positions over the years and what I'm doing now, even with the families that are losing their kids to fentanyl, things happen for a reason. So I'm convinced that I was up in New York doing my job. My brother on March 23rd, 2003, is in the uh, mountains of Afghanistan in the helicopter with five other brave warriors. The helicopter crashes. They all die immediately. And we got the call at midnight. My sister called hysterical crying. I'll never forget it. We're with you, brother. We're with you here. And uh, after that, that's when I think my life changed. Because I knew I had to get back to Washington to do a better job at this interagency coordination because our country's under attack and for the rest of my life, we're under attack. And I knew it. I had the passion for it. And so luckily, Morgan, and this is another really cool story I want to share because I didn't really get to share this too often, although I did say it at Karen Tandy's retirement party. Karen Tandy was the administrator and Karen Tandy had a lot of experience with SOD. When I was there as a staff coordinator, she was one of the line attorneys from Department of Justice, and I always got along very well with her. She was very engaged. She cared about the cases. And to be honest with you, at that time, a lot of DEA agents weren't giving the attorneys the time of day. And it's a long story. Why? Because it was a pain in the neck. There was a lot of bureaucracy involved. But all Karen Tandy wanted to do was help. So I went with my instinct. She wants to help. We want to work with each other. We need the attorneys. So I was very nice to her. I never knew she'd be the administrator one day and she would help me get into a position in my life. So what happened was, as you know, 
When I was the ASAC in New York, they called me down to Washington to help with Karen Tanney's priority project, the Yosadef Fusion Center. And she called me up. She said, Derek, I need a favor. I need you to come to Washington. I need to talk to you. So I go down to Washington in 2003. She says, look, I need you. You're the guy for the job. You have the passion. You have the relationships. You know about SOD. We're standing up my priority, OSADEF Fusion Center. Now, keep in mind, she was the OSADEF director prior to that. So she, she knew how to bring agencies together. She had the SOD experience. So I come in to Washington to be this guy, to stand it up. She told me, there's no promotions guaranteed. We don't have an SES to run the spot at this time. I just need you to help. So then I find out, like shortly thereafter, I'm going to do TDYs to Washington. And I go down there, and it was very disorganized. I didn't want to start ratting people out and telling the boss that you bring me down here, but there's nothing like, what am I supposed to do? So I then get assigned to the information sharing project of DOJ. So I go over there. I'm with smart guys like Morgan. He's running this thing. I'm like, what the hell am I doing here? It's six months after my brother died in Afghanistan. I left my little kids back at home, and I'm listening to all these bureaucrats. Of course, Morgan wasn't one of them. He was the smart guy trying to pull everyone together. And I'm sitting there going, I don't fit in here. I got to get out of here. And I go, why the hell am I here? I'm supposed to be here for the fusion center. So anyway, I knew at that moment that the DEA threw me in there just to have a warm body in the seat. But the intelligence division was dropping the ball at that time in DEA, and I was pissed off. So now I was pissed off. Six months after my brother died, I wasn't going to take any of this crap. So I tried my best to do the job. Mike Ferguson was up to the chief of operations. So after about a week going to these meetings, I wore out the, the my shoes were gone from all these meetings in the Beltway, running around with Stacey Barrera, a great lady who ultimately helped stand up the Fusion Center. And I go into the, uh, the uh, horse holder, the assistant to Mike Ferguson. I said, look. I need a meeting with the administrator. I'm getting out of here. I'm going home. They're like, you're going home, dude. You're crazy. This is your career. I go, I don't care about my career. I care about my kids and my family. Because in my mind, I'm thinking my father, 30 years of his life, he sacrificed his family, right? Then I'm thinking my brother died. I got to get home. My kids are more important. My wife's more important. She needs me. So anyway, they didn't believe it. So I go out one night to ch at Champs with Mike Ferguson. He looks at me, he goes, hey, dude. Are you kidding me? You want to go home? I go, Mike, in all due respect, I love you like a brother. I got to go to my kids. I lost my kid, my, my brother. I got to go home, and I'm not dealing with this madness in Washington right now. He goes, the administrator is not going to be happy. I said, oh, well, I got to take care of my family, more important. So long story short, he convinced me to hang in there. Don't, don't get too crazy. Relax. It's going to all work out. Things weren't working out. More information, sharing meetings with Morgan. I'll never forget the day I'm in there and you guys were asking for systems of records for all the agencies. And I'm scratching my head going, what the hell are they? It's the Intel's division job. I'm not here to talk about this. I'm an operations guy. So anyway, I expressed my, my um, disappointment. So I had another meeting. I go up to the front office. I said, I need an appointment with Karen Tanney. If I don't get an appointment, I'm just going to walk in. So I get a call from Michelle Linhart, deputy administrator. She says, Derek, what's, what's going on? I tell her what's going on. She gives me a big hug. She goes, Derek, your, your health and your situation, your priorities with your family are more important than the fusion center. So I go into Karen Tandy. She sits me down. I tell her the whole story. She says, Derek, just like Michelle said, I could find a replacement for the fusion center, but I need you and I need you to work hard and I need you to be with your family. So I'm sending you home. I said, boss, I appreciate that. I will continue to work remotely, come down to meetings, but I got to be home with my kids. So anyway, this happens, but here's the best part of the story that a lot of people don't know. About a month later, I'm down in Washington. In November of 2003, I'm down in Washington. I get a call. The boss needs to see you. So I go upstairs. I don't know what she's going to say, but I'm thanking her because I felt better. I felt like I'm home with my family. I'm where I'm at. I need where, where I need to be. She says, Derek, let me shake your hand. I'm like, what the hell is she asking to shake my hand for? She goes, uh, happy Thanksgiving, and your father's going to have a nice Thanksgiving as well. So I said, what the hell is she talking about? Congratulations, Derek. You're the new associate SAC of the New York Drug Enforcement Task Force. And I couldn't even believe it. That's leadership, by the way. 
I walked out of there. She said, don't tell anyone. Don't call anyone. Don't tell anyone because I have other picks I'm making and I don't want it to get out. I said, you got it, boss. I gave her a hug. And I proved on that moment that leaders that care about their people, they, they want you to be authentic and real. They don't want you to pretend that you're somebody else. So I walked in and I called my father. He was crying on the phone like a baby. And I was the most amazing moment because, like, I never really understood it until later on. But this was his life. And now he can listen to my stories and keep him actively involved in his own little weird way. I mean, parents do that all the time. That's why you have crazy adults on the sideline at football games and lacrosse games because they're living their life through the kids. And we all know what that means, right? So that was an amazing story, but that gave me motivation like you can't even imagine. Now I'm going to be the chief of the task force. Well, I only worked there a short time because I worked like a year and a half, two years. But then I got the other call. Karen Tandy's on the phone, Mr. Maltz. I'm like, oh, my God, where the hell am I going? I'm home. I don't want to go anywhere. The Big Apple is my home. Derek, how you doing? It's Karen Tandy. Hey, boss, how you doing? How you doing, Derek? Everything's great, boss. Thank you very much. Derek, congratulations. You're now the sack of the Special Operations Division. I was so ecstatic. I can't tell you. It was like everything was coming together. The plan was coming to place. God's plan for me, in my opinion, was happening because they needed me back at that time to take what Joe Keefe, Richie Fiano, Mike Ferguson, Bill Mokler, and all of these guys, Mike Horn, John Wallace, Mary Lee Warren, everything that they built, this foundation was now set up for me to take it to another level. When I got there in 2005, there were nine agencies. But I knew we needed all the agencies to come together because, remember, the criminals generate billions of dollars and the terrorists need those dollars to operate. So I knew I had a very important job. Plus, I also watched the 9-11 commissions to see all the, the, the commission investigation to see all the failures of information sharing. And I knew the responsibility that I had after my brother died, I couldn't let him down either. And Murph will tell you, cause he was there, you know, it was very sad, but when I got to SOD, I had to establish the, the vision real clearly. Keep your, do- your badges at the door. I took the drug enforcement administration off the seal of SOD because it was no longer about just the DEA. It was about all the agencies. So perception's reality. You didn't need to rub the the DEA flag in the faces of our counterparts. You just had to work hard and protect the American public. And that was the vision. So when I got there, of course, it was very difficult because, you know, a lot has changed after 9-11, right? And like I said, we had that special coordination unit and there was a lot more responsibilities. But You know, we could talk for a week about the great experiences that I had at SOD. But early on, I was tested on my TDY. And I'll make this story very short because it's a painful story if I go on and on and on. The the guy at the time that was in charge of the U.S. Customs operation, Fred Walsh, he came in and he said, we have a big problem, boss. And I was only I was TDY. I was acting, you know, I, I mean, I wasn't acting, but I was down from New York in my transition. And he said, we have this major Mexican guy, part of our operation, money laundering operation. Doughboy was the name. The DEA wants to arrest him because he's a big target out of Indianapolis. And he's coming to town for St. Patrick's Day in, 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 uh, in that year, 2005. I said, yeah. He goes, we don't want him arrested because it's going to compromise our operations around the world. So I call up to Rick Sanders, the SAC of DEA Chicago, and Tim Ogden, the deputy SAC at the time. And I said, look, I'm here new. I'm trying to get information. What, what's going on? And they tell me the guy's delivering five kilos a week into Indianapolis. He's this big target. But I tell them, well, yeah, he might be a big target for Indianapolis, but HSI at the time it was Customs is doing this worldwide operation. Uh, and they, they, they started the first ever wiretap in Guadalajara, Mexico, we don't want to compromise the relationships with them. Long story short, the DEA in Chicago was such gentlemen, they deferred to my knowledge and expertise, and they didn't arrest the guy. So they let him come into Chicago and go back to Mexico. And Customs at the time, and they might have been ICE at that time because they were transitioning after 9-11, they were so amazed that a DEA executive 
would would actually make a decision in favor of of them at the time as opposed to DEA. And I said it was a pretty simple decision. You got to look at the big picture. You got to look at what's in the best interest of the U.S. government, not any one agency. So my credibility with the uh, the customs and then the uh, I call them customs, but it was ICE at the time, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, was which was formed after 9/11. So that was like my immediate. I was thrown into the fire, but it was a great experience, and that was in like I said, March of 2005. Yeah, and the the significance of what the story Derek just told you is that there was still, you would think that all the agencies would work together in, in complete harmony and no conflict, you know, no territorialism. And that's just the furthest thing from the truth. And the fact that he took up for an ICE investigation over a DEA investigation is phenomenal. But like you said, with, with San, Rick Sanders and, and uh, Timmy Ogden up there, super guys, who had actually walked the walk, had done the job, and recognized the significance of what Derek was presenting to them. God bless that. That's an extremely unusual for that to happen. So, Murph, do you remember this part? I can't remember where you were at this time, but then I got a call from the administrator's office because the U.S. attorney in Indianapolis, Susan Brooks, called screaming and yelling, who is this Derek Maltz guy? Who is this guy? He doesn't have a right to tell us who we're going to arrest. This guy was a priority target. So I had to tell the front office of DEA, based on my experience and what I was told, it was the best decision. And I was fully supported by Karen Tandy. And that went away. But the thing is, is that it's hard to explain this unless you lived it. But that credibility boost has lived with me even to this day with the current Homeland Security Investigations leadership, because they recognized that I wasn't there just waving the DEA flag. I was waving the American flag to do the job for the American public the best I could. But M- Morgan, Murph knows this, but you didn't. You never experienced this. Sadly, when I did my presentations early on as the head of the SOD, try to build some momentum, I would have to show the jumpers from the World Trade Center. I'd have to show the building on fire. I actually made video clips of the plane going into the buildings and seeing the massive explosions. And then I would always show my brother Mike's last day alive in Afghanistan. And I would set it up like this. And it was very dramatic, and I did it for a reason. You see this guy here? He was a pararescue guy in the United States Air Force. And he went over to fight for the country after 9-11. Unfortunately, he came back in a body bag. And unfortunately, he told his mother the next time he sees her son, he's going to be in the morgue or he's going to be in the funeral parlor. And that guy is my brother. And I'm the head of this SOD. And we're not going to tolerate the lack of information sharing because our country is under attack. And believe it or not, as corny as that may sound, it actually worked. Absolutely. And then I would go into these meetings with these bureaucrats. And when I saw the body language, they weren't listening to this loudmouth New Yorker and they were shying away. I would do it even more passionately. I would show... For example, later on, I'd show the the Madrid train bombing. I got a copy of the video and show the explosion. Ba-boom! And tell them, this could happen in the New York subway tomorrow. We got to work together. So I I, I ratcheted up the level of enthusiasm and passion and also created an environment of ownership for all, as opposed to ownership of me as the boss or the DEA. It was the ownership of U.S. law enforcement, DOD, and the intel community. That's how I was able to expand the place because the foundation was already built. The tools were in place. The communication exploitation was in place. Now the partners came to join. So I started with nine. I left with 30 agencies. But probably my proudest day was when I got a call from the front office of NYPD and Ray Kelly's office asked me to come up to brief the commissioner and his executive team. So I went up there all fired up, 20 minutes to present. How is DEA doing all this crime and terror stuff? You're taking down Victor Boo. You're taking down Monza Gasol. You're taking down Hezbollah. You're exposing Hezbollah's role with cocaine trafficking. So I gave him a brief in 20 minutes. He stops the brief and he says, Derek, I've heard enough. Tremendous stuff. He goes, how do I get one of my guys at NYPD in your, in your operation? I said, Commissioner, we could start Monday. He says, Derek, don't bullshit me. I was down there. We got to have the clearances. I said, Commissioner, 
I am not bullshitting. You're trying to protect the citizens of my hometown, New York City. You're under attack. We'll start Monday. If they have the clearance, they start. He shakes my hand. He gives me the cufflinks. He gives me a hug. And he says, it's happening. David Cohen, chief of intelligence, he was the one. They assigned the best and brightest. Jimmy O'Sullivan was my first guy, a lieutenant from NYPD intelligence. He comes down. I love the guy even to this day. He comes down and we start. And, and to be honest with you, and I'll just say it because I'm not going to BS this audience, not with you guys. At the time, elements of the FBI were not sharing a lot of their terrorism information appropriately with like the NYPD, for an example, because NYPD is very aggressive. And FBI is trying to protect the sources and methods, protect the investigation. And I understand it, but there's got to be a sense of urgency. So I felt way more comfortable making sure FBI was in the loop on anything I had in SOD. So it actually helped us close a gap. Now, it pissed off some of the bureaucrats in Washington that I would invite the NYPD in and start giving them potential terrorist information. And I would say, wait a minute. Hold on. Let me get let me understand that. We're under attack. We lost thousands of Americans. My brother died. All these brave men and women are dying, coming back in body bags. And you're worried about me sharing information with NYPD? I don't really care. We're going to get the job done. So that was the kind of attitude. And it actually rubbed some people the wrong way because the bureaucrats want to be in control of everything. In this country, you can't have a lead agency yet. You could have someone responsible, but they're not the only ones that bring something to the table. So that was another really important story in my development at SOD. So let, let me throw in something, too. Um, this is the longest I've gone without talking, Murph, if you haven't noticed. Oh, and we were kind of enjoying that moment there, Morgan. <laughs> yeah, here you go. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I wish I really wish you would have stayed on our project for a couple of reasons. Number one, it took a long time to get everybody's attention. But one of the ways I got somebody's attention one time, not not as dramatic as yours, but having somebody. We had so many people in the room who had never put handcuffs on anybody never worked a case. They were policy people and stuff. They were the wrong people to be in the room, to your point. But it took one day finally, and I coordinated this with my boss. I said, we're, we're going to, we gamed this out. This is how we're going to do it. Finally got to the point, they're all talking about, well, we can't do this. We can't do that. I finally slammed my hand down onto the table, like, you know, wham, really hard. I'm not doing it now because I'll disturb my cats who are sleeping. Uh, right here. I slammed my hand down on the table and I said, because we'd help put together briefing materials for the 9-11 commission. You know, one of the lessons learned is failure of imagination out of that. But I slammed my hand down on the table. I said, look, my homicide trumps all of your damn turf battles. I got a dead body here. I need to know where the information is. I can't go. I can't be playing, a, you know, fugitive hunt trying to find the information. And I'll tell you, one of the great things we had out of this, Virginia O'Brien, who was a, a assistant director over at ATF, shows up one day and she's so excited. She's got the letter from John Ashcroft. And it's because of the D.C. sniper shooting. It's because of, I think, a lot of what you brought to the table, too, guys. we got to share information. But we have to put it in one place where everybody can access it. That was the day to where they said there, sh oh, will, there will only be one repository of ballistic information, and it will be ATF. Now it's called NIBIN, the National Integrated Ballistic Information Network. And uh, it, it's that was a small success to start with. But to your point, Derek, why should cops, state and local cops, have to search three systems looking for the same piece of information? Right, right. That absolutely. And, and honestly, not to, like, again, I don't want to go back to my engagement with you, but I will say that you impacted me in a major way because I was able to see right through the smoke and mirrors in that room that you were trying to do the right thing and that you had the knowledge and the understanding of the environment. And you also had the technical experience that was needed. Cause as you guys know, in Washington, sometimes we're lacking the technical guys that really understand. And I was one of them. I wasn't this genius in technology. I've learned a lot over the years, but I, I'll never forget the impact that you made. And I'm, again, I'm not stroking you. I, I don't need to do that, but I'm being very sincere about it. So I appreciate what you've done creating some of these foundations that we have now today and well, who would have thought it morgan actually did something good all right <laughs> yes he did <laughs> uh, years more. and i got it from Derek. Mott, but it was so funny too because it was easy like i say uh see that's not a picture i wanted to see there Derek. uh look at that this is what i want to tell you could. okay right now because i hung this in my office at sod by the light switch across from my desk what does it say it's the daily news headlines it was may 20th 2004 
We did all we could. Mayor Giuliani at the 9-11 Commission. Now, it, this is not a political thing. It has nothing to do with Mayor Giuliani. But he was under attack by all the, the second guesses, the naysayers. Could we have done more? Did we do enough? And I used to live this nightmare at SOD thinking that we had all this intelligence around the world. If it doesn't get to the right people for action, I'm going to be held accountable like Mayor Giuliani and the citizens are going to be pissed off. So this was my reminder. And honestly, it, it's, it's not I keep it in my office today because it's a reminder what's going on. This was the other one that I, was one of my famous ones. This is the families on the stage. My other bro, my only brother and 3000 others deserved a privilege of a warning because they blew up. You know, they 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 were incinerated in in the uh, in the in the bombing and, and and they were pissed off. And I knew and I could tell stories about this with the Avianca plane crash and what we did at JFK Airport on our little study that we did. I was afraid that the Colombian narco terrorist as you guys know, Murph knows very well because his guy blew up the plane, right? I mean, Pablo Escobar and those nasty bastards in Medellin, right? They, you know, Danny Mascara or whatever the true story is, I don't know, blew up the plane because they thought, what, a DEA informant was on the plane or some politician, whatever the truth is. But I knew that they could easily blow up a plane coming into JFK in unmanifested luggage, putting explosives instead of heroin. And that's another whole story for another day. But I didn't want to be the guy that, well, you knew that Avianca was bringing in heroin in unmanifested luggage and your SOD, what did you do about it? So I was getting inundated with lots of things like that. So I needed constant reminders so I didn't take my eye off the ball. Something you brought up too, I don't know if you were this, this kind of came out of some of the work we were doing um, with the information sharing, but you look at 9-11 and you, this is this is a perfect example about how one hand didn't know what the other hand was doing, and they weren't sharing information. So Nawaf Al Hazmi, one of the main planners, along with Mohammed Atta, was stopped by the Oklahoma Highway Patrol, written the traffic ticket in April of 2001. He was put on a State Department watch list in August of 2001. The problem with that is he's already in the country. It does no good to put somebody on a watch list who's already in the country. Nobody checked what we call the National Crime Information Center. Nobody checked NCIC to see, is this dude already in the country? Was his name checked? He was. His name was in the system because he was stopped, written a ticket. Mohammed Atta was stopped uh, in July down in Florida. He had warrants for his arrest for overstaying his visa. Um, you know, he overstayed his visa and he had warrants for his arrest. That information wasn't shared, so the deputies couldn't take him into custody. This is this is the part that pissed me off when I was down at Justice, and that's why you were – let me tell you what, and I'm not going to stroke your ego. This is just fact. You were the only guy down there that had a fucking clue about what it took to make shit happen because everybody else was a policy person. Um, uh, we, we had to rotate some people out. Finally got to the point. Our executive sponsor of the uh, project was James Comey at the time. He was the deputy attorney general, the DAG. And we finally got to the point. We, we went up and we said, we got to rotate a couple people out because they're nothing but lead weights. They don't, they don't do shit. Morgan, as you know, and the government's notorious for this, when they need to assign a body to one of these kind of projects, they dump the dead wood. They just dump whoever's not working. They want to get rid of them. And unfortunately, then you can't get the job done. There's that old saying in the government, right? If you want something done right, you give it to a busy person, right? Isn't that the case, right? You have like 10%, 15% of the hard charges, and you have to get the job done, so you give it to them. But anyway, they get overworked, they get pissed off, the morale goes down. But yeah, that stuff back in those days was very exciting for me and also to learn so much about really what was going on in the Beltway with the lack of information sharing. So I had to bring some reality to all of these meetings, and maybe some people thought I was out of my mind. But again, I tell people all the time, don't confuse passionate with crazy. I may be, you may think I'm crazy, but I'm just passionate who gives a shit about the country and the people, and I took my job serious. And so, yeah, some people want to try to twist that all the time. Uh, just a... Uh a uh, factoid here. I still have your business card you gave me from that meeting. <laughs> uh, interesting. Well, I still had some of the stuff that you you put together when I was at SOD for years because I used to go back and refer to some of the concepts to try to learn because it was overwhelming me. So thank you. But you know, Derek, you made a good point there that you know they give it to the busy people 
But then the bureaucrats are still complaining. The question is, what are they doing to help forward the operation rather than sitting around bitching and complaining because somebody else is actually doing something? Right. Well, that's another whole story. I mean, you know how that works. Everyone who worked in government knows like that's the way it is. You just have to deal with it and keep marching forward. Don't let the bureaucrats get in the way. And obviously never let the bureaucracy get in the way of the mission. And that was always the challenge. One thing I want to uh, touch on here, too, before we get away from Michael is is uh, you got to go over to Afghanistan one time. Yeah. Oh, you my God. Me. Great. Thank you, Murph, for bringing that up. So, Morgan, check this out. This is a really good story from my perspective. So I get asked to go to Afghanistan in 2009. And Keith Bishop, former legend in NFL football, Denver Broncos, right guard with John Elway, he was assigned over there. Keith Weiss, who now is the Haida director out in uh, Colorado. So, you know, head. Keith was on our – Keith was on Game of Crimes. Murph got him set up. We interviewed Bish. Yeah. The only, only interview he's ever given. I know. He's a great man. Anyway, so here's the story because it's a really good story. So I didn't want to go, but I didn't want to be that guy to say no, right? We're trying to support Afghanistan. I had my guys coming in, you know, from my bilateral teams over there, and I had to go to see what it was about. So I get on a flight, I go over there, and I get there, and the first thing that happens is the complete chaos. Well, we land in Dubai, we stay overnight, then we take that Afghan airline, whatever the hell it was called, and I was scared to death because we're on the plane with all these government contractors. I'm thinking the missiles are going to take us out of the sky as we're coming in over the mountains of Afghanistan. I was really, really scared. I'm not going to lie. We get in the country. It's chaos at the airport. We get in there. There's Keith Bishop. I felt much more comfortable with Keith Bishop because I knew what a tough guy he was and I knew he was going to take care of me. So we get in the car. First thing he does is shows me the bullet holes in the back of his car. So I'm like, what is that? He goes, I was driving down and they following these bastards and they were shooting at me. I'm like, what? Oh, my God. They give me a machine gun. They give me the vest in the parking lot. Hey, dude, you're in the real world here now. So now I'm like, I don't want to say it, but I'm like, what am I doing here? If my wife knew this. So we get in the car. We start driving. So this is great. He goes into the CIA. Wait, wait a minute. Wait, wait a minute. Hold on. Your wife didn't know where you were at? No, she knew where I was at, but she had no idea what I was getting into. Oh, okay, okay. Right? And I didn't really know, and you'll, you'll hear the story <laughs> in a second. So as we're coming up to the CIA, CIA compound, Keith Bishop is driving. I'm in the back seat, and there's a gate, and it was really cool. So I take out my camera, my little phone camera, start taking pictures. I thought it was cool, right? The guys with machine guns were at the gate. So now the guy comes out. The contractor comes out and he says, what's going on here? Who's taking the pictures? And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm in the back seat. I don't know what to say. <laughs> and Keith's looking at him. He wants to punch him in the face. And Keith says, no one taking pictures here. And I said, uh, I said nothing, but I knew I was taking pictures. I didn't know what was going on. Long story short, he goes back. He's talking to the guy. He comes back again. He goes, I need the camera. Somebody was taking pictures here. And I'm going, what do I do? I threw my phone underneath my, my, my seat. I was panicking like a little kid. Anyway, I see it's getting a little crazy. I'm not going to get out of here. So I confessed to it. I deleted everything off the phone. I showed the guy. He was happy that I deleted it. He wasn't so happy that I lied to him because I didn't know. I was scared. And we start driving away, and Keith's laughing his ass off. He goes, you know, that guy... That 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 Pat that Afghani guy that was working the security just got a big bonus. That's how they operate by by actually coming up with a security violation. So long story, we get to the DEA compound, and I'm really amazed. I'm very nervous because it's right at the uh, base of a mountain, and I'm thinking Taliban's going to start sending missiles and blowing us up. So I'm thinking all of this stuff. We go into the cafeteria. The food was outstanding. I was very impressed. They had those ice cream bars. I had three or four of them. They had the Afghans cooking. It was awesome. They had a weight room. It was a beautiful thing. We went out to the fire pit at night. They were drinking beers. It was awesome. I wasn't as scared. But here's what happens. While I'm in eating breakfast the next day, I'm thinking, what happens if one of these Afghan cooks comes in with a backpack bomb and blows up everyone in here? I was thinking that. Well, let me flash forward. A, a couple months later, they hit the CIA compound the same way. So anyway... We're there. Then they want me to climb this mountain. They have this famous thing. You go up the mountain. First of all, we're such a high altitude. Just going up there was tough for an old guy. 
going up the mountain. I didn't want to say no, but I was following my guys who had machine guns up to the top. And then I'm thinking, we're going to get some snipers going to kill us, right? So I was thinking all these crazy things. Next day, they have, they take me on an operation. They don't tell me what it is. I told my guys, Rob Patterson was with me. Mark Hamill was with me. I said, I want no helicopters in Afghanistan. I'm not going on helicopters. So we get to an airfield and there's three State Department UE helicopters sitting there. And I'm starting to get nervous thinking like maybe they're going to put me on one of these helicopters. They don't tell me anything. And all of a sudden the guy comes out very official looking and he has papers and he passes them out to everybody. And he has what they call Operation M squared. I'm like, what the hell are we doing? Like no one told me. Well, Operation M squared was as we were en route to the Bagram Air Force Base, they were going to take me to where my brother's helicopter crashed. And they're going to allow me to throw a wreath on top of his, 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 his crash site. And I'm like, I can't say no now. I'm pissed off internally. I don't know what I'm getting into. So we get in these helicopters. We fly over to this little refueling station in, near Ghazni, Afghanistan. They give me the wreath. I'm sitting there. They open the door. They said, Mr. Maltz, we're going to go right over the site. The guy's going to tell you when you throw the wreath. Wreath. So I'm like, wow. I got this euphoric moment of like, I can't even explain it, like chills in my body. So we get over the site. He's circulating. And I remember the pictures from the Air Force crash investigation. And I'm like, it's right in this area. He's like, okay, sir, you could drop the wreath right now. So I'm hanging out of the helicopter. I drop the wreath. It's circling and circling. I'm going, oh, my God. I got this overwhelming rush in my body of closure. Like, oh, my God. I'm here where my brother was killed. This is awesome. I was so thankful. So then after that, we fly back. We get into the helicopters. We go over to Bagram. Now what they set up is the brother of Mike Maltz. And Mike was a legend in the Air Force Pararescue Unit. I'm saying that legitimately. Like, he was an instructor. They all loved him. So I went to the unit that my brother worked in with all these warriors, and they let me brief all of them. And it was so emotional because they all loved my brother. Then they took me out to the helicopters, and they let me take pictures. But the saddest thing is I got a picture from somebody. The night my brother's helicopter crashed, they were, he was supposed to come back to the spot on the, you know, the tarmac, whatever you call it. And there was a missing helicopter. So they had like three or four of them in line, and then the end spot was missing. That was Mike's helicopter that crashed. So it was an amazing experience, probably the top experience I ever had in DEA when it comes to a personal situation. And thank you, Murph, for bringing that up, because I would have forgot that story. Man, I've, I've got goosebumps right uh, now. Look, man, I just, my next I've already started tearing up. Um, that's just, um, was, it, was it an accident or hostile fire? Well, that's another good question. I had to deal with that madness, too, because my old man was so pissed off at uh, at President Bush at the time, even though he was a diehard Republican, because he felt that we were spreading our resources too thin between Afghanistan and, uh, you know, Iraq. Right. And he just felt like a typical government operation. You have limited resources. You have to stay focused. And he felt that at that time it was mismanaged. So anyway, he was convinced that Mike was shot down because Mike did some top secret stuff. He didn't really share, obviously, with them, but he shared some of that stuff with me at times because I had the clearances. But he was over there going behind enemy lines, so anything couldn't happen. So my father felt like they were lying to the family, and they didn't tell my father the truth. The helicopter crashed during a refuel operation. It crashed during you know, a very bad storm. I personally believe today that they crashed because it was just a pilot error. It was the conditions and everything like that. I don't know that for sure. But my father, till the day he died, was convinced that Mike was shot down. I have no idea, but I used to tell him, hey, Pop, it doesn't matter if he was shot down or he got into a crash. He was killed in action trying to protect America, and he was killed doing what he loved. And it doesn't matter. That happens all the time. So stop this nonsense. But anyway, what's interesting about it is this is really another euphoric moment. You just can't believe it. I was doing a presentation out in our San Francisco division of DEA, and it was in ASAC. And 
I apologize. I briefly forgot his name. I, I just can't remember it. And I really feel bad because his story is amazing. He comes up to me, he says, Mr. Maltz, I want to tell you, I'm, I'm part of the Air Force uh, National Guard. And uh, I, don't, I don't know how to tell you this, but after your brother's helicopter crashed, I had to continue the mission that he was on to rescue Afghan children. And if you don't mind, I want to share a picture with you. He gave me a picture of the poor little Afghan kid with the bandage wrapped around the head with the father in the back of the helicopter because this DEA ASAC was asked to go and do the mission my brother's crew couldn't do. And he gave me the picture. I still have it. And I feel terrible right now. I just, for whatever reason, I got a mind. My mind is blank. He was the ASAC out there. And I couldn't thank him enough. But it was another piece of the puzzle I needed. And of course, I have the Air Force investigation. And there was some inconsistencies to the story in what they told my mother and what they told my father. So I don't know what happened. But then it gets even better. Years later, through the social media network, and I have the book up here somewhere, I get contacted by a guy who was on the C-130 during the refuel operation, and he wrote a book, and it's in the book. He told me the story. He said, Derek, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to tell you this sooner, but let me tell you what I know, because I was on the C-130 doing the refuel. There were two helicopters that night. Mike was on one of the helicopters. They were flying over Afghanistan. They both needed to be refueled. Helicopter number one got connected immediately to the, to the fuel line. They did their thing and they flew away. Helicopter number two, for whatever reason, the experienced pilot let the inexperienced pilot operate the helicopter that night and she could not connect to the fuel line and it took too long, he said. And he was explaining it to me. And he goes, Derek, I hope you're not mad at me for telling you this, but the next thing I saw was a giant fireball as your brother's helicopter smashed into the mountains. And that was another story because, you know, they have the Maltz Challenge around the world right now. It's a, it's a cross-fitness challenge around the world. It started in like 2006 to honor all these brave warriors. Initially, it was started for my brother, but now it just continues on every year. And every year we add all these new warriors who have died around the world fighting for our freedom. But anyway, this guy was amazing. And he sent me a book that he wrote and he gave me like, you know, the paragraphs that he wrote about this incident. So my opinion is it was an accident. It was a refuel operation accident. There was, a, you know, a little bit of inexperience, you know, the conditions. I'm not blaming anybody because this stuff happens, you know, but that's what I think. But, but, but my father was obsessed with, he was shot down. And those bastards never told us the truth. So I was dealing with that for the rest of his life until he died. And just tell us a little bit more about the Maltz Challenge. Did you start that, or is that a military thing? No. What happened was, so Keith Billiot, who worked at SOD, you know, is a former, you know, military uh, officer, and a bunch of guys in DEA uh, that worked in the military, worked in our FAST team. They came up with the concept to do this Maltz Challenge. It started at SOD in honor of Michael Maltz, my brother. And it was basically this cross fitness routine, which is so amazing. Like I couldn't even dream of doing it, you know, Me 50 either. pull-ups and the push-ups and the, and the runs and the carries and uh, forget about it. It's off the charts intense. So they did this thing in honor of Mike initially. And then DEA around the world started, you know, getting other partners on board. And then next thing you know, they were nominating every year, each office would nominate a hero who died and they would all go out and do the cross fitness. Well, over time, we started getting NFL teams to give us their facilities like the New York Giants, Detroit Lions, right? Denver Broncos. Actually, Keith Bishop was the first because he worked for security. The Denver Broncos, he made magic happen. They used to host the Denver event every year. They still host it, provide the facilities and the media and stuff like that. And then we had, you know, like the Redskins at the time when they were the Redskins, they hosted us and it started expanding Cleveland Browns and then Baltimore Under Armour started supporting us because one of our agents who retired was in security of Under Armour. So he actually convinced the CEO and the others that this was the right thing to do. So they would host us. Last year, the Baltimore Ravens stepped up and I believe the coach was out there also supporting it. So it's expanded around the world. And it's a great honor, and I'm happy that Mike's name is attached to it, but I'm more happy about 
the great families that I've met. I've been to the Under Armour facility and, you know, I don't know if you know the, the famous story, Brendan Looney and Travis Manion. They were blood brothers and lacrosse players at Annapolis. They died, you know, close together. They're buried together over there at, at the Arlington. And I met the wife and it was just amazing. I met all these. As a matter of fact, I was on national news this week. One of the other fathers sent me a message, you know, saying what a good job I did or whatever, and just thanking me for service. So I've met a lot of people over the years that are, you know, very supportive of the Maltz Challenge. Yeah. So all our listeners out there, if you if you're if you're into this kind of thing, or you just think you're a tough person, Google the Maltz Challenge, M A L T Z Challenge, in honor of Michael Maltz. See what the 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 uh, the parameters are of the exercises you have to do, and give it a shot. I mean, there's no, even one of the best shape I was ever in my life. There's no way I could have completed that. Day, well, but. they also made the half malts challenge more, more for fat guys like us and old guys. <laughs> they, and now it's so cool, Morgan. You know what they do now? A lot of people, they go there and they walk a little bit. They may do one push up. They don't even care. They're not doing the routine. They're there to support the men and women that are sacrificing their lives. Hey, players, that is the end of part one. Part two, as always, comes out on Thursday. In the meantime, check us out at Game of Crimes on Twitter, at Game of Crimes Podcast on Facebook, at the Instagram. But where you got to be, where you got to be, where you got to be, got to be on Patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. We have a ton of good stuff, including if you are at the right level, Guardian of the Realm and Warden of the Throne, we have just released part one, episode one of the real DEA Narcos talking about the real DEA Narcos, Cali edition, Chris Feistel and Dave Mitchell go in-depth, 16 hours about how they took down the Cali cartel. Information you will not hear anywhere else in the world, not on Netflix, not anywhere, not in a book, only right here on Game of Crimes at patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. In the meantime, also go check out our webpage, gameofcrimespodcast.com. We've got the latest merch, pictures for every episode that we put up, books that our guests write. We only put up books that they write. We put them up there. So we thank you once again for being a player in the biggest, baddest, most dangerous game of all, the... Game of Crimes.